Hi, Celeste. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you for having me and giving yeah, me. Yeah, really exciting. I mean, we're recording for Blue Knot Day, so yeah, just 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 wondering. Um, yeah, if, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you how you came to be having a conversation with me today. <laughs> well, I've been on quite a journey throughout my life, I must say. Um, I went through a lot of childhood trauma and abuse and neglect. Um, I never went to school either. So I left home when I was 16. I didn't have an education. I didn't have any money, a license, but I sort of said, I'm out. Um, and yeah, through that, I guess my journey was, yeah, a journey of, I was quite a fighter for a long time. So I didn't want to acknowledge all the trauma that I'd been through. Um, so I kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Um, I studied in multiple different sectors. Um, I've just actually finished my degree majoring in sociology with a double minor in law and justice and wow. community development as well. And That's I did amazing. That. Without education, <laughs> let me say. Yeah, yeah, and I rocked up to the sort of, I rocked up to university. I was like, um, so I've never actually been to school. I have nothing marked and I didn't quite know. I hadn't had a case like mine, but they could tell I was quite intellectual. So they decided to give me a go as such. So yeah, I pushed through that um, through my studies and my work. I've also worked in sectors of um, disability support, palliative home care. I did a little Little bit of youth residential um, work as well, um, as well as volunteering at Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. Um, so I was always very much go, go, go. I'm going to push through, travel the world. But it was about five years ago, actually, when I moved to Melbourne that my what I call my pain body awoke. <laughs> and for the first time, I realised, OK, <laughs> maybe the things that happened to me were not OK. And my mind has created created many blank spaces to protect me from that truth. So, yeah, within this five years of this healing journey, um, yeah, this trauma healing, I have been on <laughs> quite the ride. As everyone who knows who's been through trauma healing, it isn't lineal. Um, there would be times that I would feel this oneness you know for the first time because I think that trauma can really lift the veil um to yes yeah, something higher because you have to dig so deep within yourself to get through that pain and there was times that I just wanted to run from that pain and overcommit to everything in every single way <laughs> Uh, do anything I could not to feel it. And I'm sure many trauma survivors yeah. uh, resonate with that, uh, that healing isn't lineal. But yeah, I'm on this path now that I, yeah, I finished my degree, I quit my jobs, and I'm just taking time to just focus on my healing, you know, and stepping into that silence with yourself is sometimes when your mind becomes the loudest. Mm. But it's being able to be with that, mm. learning to be with myself again yeah. through whatever it is and hold myself through it. That has really what has led me here today. Yes. Yeah. So, so what's actually helped you in that process? Because what you describe is that, you know, it sounds like you've lived five lifetimes already and perhaps in a way to, to, to try and avoid the pain to a degree from what you're saying so what's really helped you you know when you started to, to really have to deal with it what's helped you along the way I think finding faith and it doesn't have to be faith in one thing as in you know a religion or a god but faith in something higher and faith in myself this faith that there's this thing inside me that wants to heal, which is why that all this trauma was coming up because I didn't want to hold on to it anymore. My body wanted to let go of it. And in that letting go can be a lot of pain, but finding that faith that like trauma isn't a life sentence you know that you can get through it to the point once you work through it to the point that you can find safety in your body again um, I've worked with many different practitioners as well I'm about to embark on EMDR but I've done uh, many I've worked with a lot of different um, trauma therapists I've done talk therapy I've done um, psychotherapy as well um, working in neurorehabilitation within, uh, at, at a neuro 
rehab center, things like acupuncture, but also just coming back to nature. Um, that was a big one, just feeling my feet on the ground, smelling the ocean air and yeah. learning to feel safe in my body again through a number of uh, practices such as psychosomatic yoga, breath work, uh, things like havening, even something as simple as hugging yourself, letting yourself know that it's safe to be in your body. So they're the things that have really helped me on my journey. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you've, you know, tried a lot of different processes and, and it's always hard to measure what actually contributes to what, what helps. But it does sound like you found a way of feeling safe and grounded. Um, if you feel these days that you're not as calm as you might be, what would you do? Um, I often listen to uh, music, very calming music. I do meditation. So sometimes if you've been traumatized, I'm sure people can relate. It's very hard to just sit in stillness. Mm -hmm. So I find guided meditations help for me a lot. So I do a lot of Joe Dispenza's meditations as well, which is about um, learning to feel different emotions in our body, learning to rewire new positive emotions in there. I do um, Wim Hof breath work as well. So it's these coping strategies that I have in place that I go to when I'm feeling this level of distress. Mm. It sounds like you've acquired a lot of resources along the way and you've been very thoughtful about how you've gone about it. Um, your degree is an interesting one. Yeah. And I'm just I'm just wondering, yeah, what your plans are, you know, I mean, it's amazing the journey you're going on, the healing journey, and the, the fact that you're giving yourself the time and space to heal. Mm -hmm. um, but you've also obviously got a, a career of some sort in mind or some future in mind with that degree. I'm just wanting to explore that. Yeah, well, I think my degree can take me into a number of different elements is why I've kept it quite broad. But um, something that is very close to my heart is advocacy yeah. um, and working to advocate for a trauma-informed world, particularly a trauma-informed justice system and giving survivors, you know, people just like me, some sort of support, being able to supply some uh, level of voice um, if at that time that they're feeling voiceless, you know, letting people know that they're actually not alone in this process and someone with the lived experience, that's the thing, I have to go on my own healing journey. That's what I realised before I can really help in this way. But if, you know, I look at what's been given to me in life, I'm like, okay, well, what can I do with this and how can my lived experience help? Mm. Because you have had a lived experience of the justice system. Yes. And, you know, would you be happy to talk about that a little bit mm -hmm. and to say, you know, how you would think the justice system could become more trauma informed? Yeah, 100%. So my journey of starting to seek justice for myself started almost four years ago now. Um, and in that time, uh, in separate cases, I tried to uh, prosecute two of my predators and then embarked on a criminal compensation claim after this. Um, and what I found was that our justice system is not trauma informed and it leads to such a deep re-traumatization <laughs> that yeah I couldn't decide what was more traumatic being perpetually re-victimized for myself or trying to seek justice for myself um, and what I found in the way that it wasn't trauma reformed is that it completely denies the scientifically and physiologically <laughs> proven responses of freeze disassociate, fawn, um, repression, and changing fragmented traumatic memories. So in certain cases, when I was completely frozen because my childhood pattern of freeze and disassociate would play out, this was then framed as consent in the justice system, even though on in different occasions, but on one of my cases, I had a tape call of my six-year-old life coach admitting to the abuse and admitting to what he'd done to me.
but they couldn't prove that I didn't consent because I was laying there frozen in a bodywork session. So this is where I think the justice system really needs to understand trauma most often takes place when we can't fight or flight, when our system becomes completely immobilised for threat, that it shuts down mm -hmm. and we disassociate. Yeah. So this is most often when trauma takes place and our justice system is denying this. There were also times of uh, fragmented changing traumatic memory that I'd remember more, but then I wasn't able to change my statement because then I'd be made out to be a liar. Um, there was things, a number of things said like uh, when I read a five page document from the justice system that was basically tearing me to shreds, you know, this was a, another instance that happened, a different one when I was 17. And they were saying, because of the level of intoxication, they didn't believe that the events took place. And this is what the justice system needs to understand. Predators get young, vulnerable women drunk to make them even more vulnerable. <laughs> and this is when they act. So I think the justice system needs to understand that predators have many faces and they know how to choose the vulnerable mm -hmm. and the justice system needs to understand what trauma, the reality, reality of it looks like. Mm -hmm. And that is often freeze, disassociate, immobilise, mm -hmm. change the fragmented traumatic mm -hmm. memory mm -hmm. and they need to hold some space for this in the justice system and understand the minds that they're only further fracturing. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of learning to be had, for sure. And certainly, I mean, Blue Knot's tried, you know, to, to be part of that. And, uh, you know, from what you're saying, you'll certainly be a substantial part of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously, that must have been incredibly challenging for you, though, to, to, to butt up against a system when you're seeking justice and you're seeking to be heard and understood. And, you know, how did you manage that? Um, at times I yeah at times I almost completely didn't manage yeah. I barely I barely speak about it with anybody um what yeah. was going on I you know all of the police interviews everything I'd, I'd go there alone um but it just led me into a state of uh, yeah. further shame and blame um yes. of self-shame and blame which is as a trauma survivor and a survivor of childhood sex abuse you already have that yeah. internalized, it's my fault, I'm the bad one yeah. inside of yeah. you. And when I finally decided, no, these things were not my fault, I'm yeah. ready to speak, yeah. I'm ready to seek justice, yeah. and that was shut down. That yeah. was incredibly detrimental, but yeah. it was also at some point, this is also why I enrolled in a minor in law, because I knew this yeah. was <laughs> going to try and break me. And at some point, I just had to, in my mind, tell myself that, okay, for some reason, I'm having to understand the unjust justice system so that maybe one day I can help to do something about it, you know, yeah. because it isn't just my story, it's so many women's yeah. stories yeah. and people's story. It is so difficult to get help. And it isn't that I'm saying every person in the justice system is yeah. bad, like there were people that wanted to help me, but it's that we're encased in a system, yeah. the justice system, that won't allow it, that, yeah. trauma, that it's just not trauma-informed, that people yeah. couldn't help me. But I think, yeah, so the way I managed managed it was telling myself that for some reason I've needed to intimately understand the justice system and what it does so that one day I can speak on it. Yeah, and today you are. <laughs> you that and thank Here you. I am, four yeah, years um, on. It's quite remarkable that you, you know, yeah, you've, you've processed that and you're talking now about what you can do and achieve and help. Um, what would a just what would a trauma informed justice system look like to you? And it might be hard to imagine given what you've just <laughs> described. <laughs> but you know, had, had, you know, just just maybe, yeah. You know, I just think um that there needs to be trauma informed training for all police and everyone involved in the justice system. So every single person in the justice system should go through training related to trauma so that they are better equipped to deal with it. Mm -hmm. I also believe that there should be, you know, survivors who are going to give their police interview, there should be advocates with them every time to make sure that they are being treated with respect, to make sure that they're not being pushed, to make sure that their rights are being respected. Um, yeah, a trauma-informed justice system to me looks like 
listening to survivors <laughs> and knowing that we're not going through this process because we want to lie about something we're going through this process because we want our justice yeah. why would anyone go through this you know unless it was real yeah, no absolutely and I think it's that to have compassion the way that I was spoken to or treated with to have compassion for the survivor in front of you mm -hmm. so I think that's something that you know maybe training can't even teach you but for the justice system to learn compassion yeah yeah so are you still seeking justice or have you been able to yeah yes well yeah. i am i actually just so my criminal compensation claim it's coming up to almost two years that i've been doing this now um and it was only it was under two months ago, I got a five letter email from the justice system, just yeah, brutally tearing me to shreds and knocking it back. So in the last uh, couple of months, I've been working on an appeal because it was also that um, it was all the, the people that were tied to my predator were interviewed, but the people that I said I spoke to, my sister and that, they, they weren't interviewed. So there was a lot of, <laughs> um, yeah a lot of things that my side of the story wasn't heard in this so yeah I've been putting together an appeal but I think I was devastated when I got that letter but then something about me switched and I've completely detached from the outcome so I've completely detached from the outcome and once I'm done with this whatever they say about me yeah. you know I'm done I'm closing it with the justice system and I've learned all the lessons I've needed to learn however brutal they may have been yeah. it sounds like they've been brutal and you've had way too many of them mm -hmm. uh, but you know what it's done is you know yeah um impassioned you yeah. To, to make change and it sounds like you're collecting the tools to be able to do that along the way which is yeah which is remarkable Thank you. um so how have you built a support system around you how have you have you been able to do that and just wondering about the, you know because you're saying and obviously you know when you're you know, really challenged in that way you do tend to you know because of the shame and everything closes you down to reaching out but yeah how do you build supports around you yeah I think um yeah in the past it was definitely shut down and isolate um but now I've realized the importance you know of friendships and connections and building a support network that is also friends and people mm. that you trust and love around you but then also a professional support network as well so speak having these two sort of support networks and in that has been learning that like I deserve to be held you know that people aren't going to leave me if I speak the mm. truth that my truth is powerful um learning to let love and support in because it can be very hard to accept support if you don't feel worthy of it mm -hmm. so it's been really about uh yeah raising that level of self-worth and knowing that yeah people will support me and love me like no matter what I'm going through so it's having that trust that we can often lose in the world or in others if we've been deeply traumatized but bringing that trust back in ourselves in our friends in our support in our professional support networks so yeah really building trust and safety in these relationships yeah yeah and obviously trust and safety are core and it sounds you know you talk about refinding that trust but from what you describe maybe that hadn't developed originally you know as a child i'm just yeah so no. it, was, it was something you had to had to really yeah build and learn about how how do you think you were able to do that yeah, so this is the thing that I think, well, the biggest thing that trauma took from me is not even trust in the others, but I lost trust in myself. Yes. So, you know, and childhood trauma teaches you to not trust the gut instincts that others may easily follow. So by slowly, slowly learning to trust myself and build that foundation of trust in myself, mm -hmm. that's when it's able to be reflected out and I could trust others as well but learning the right people to trust yeah. because that's then learning that discernment but mm. when we have that discernment in ourselves we know who to let in and who to push out yeah because yeah. of course boundaries are challenging when they haven't been you know safely set 
And so how do you learn those along the way? But it sounds like you've learned to navigate them uh, progressively over time. Is that, yeah. Has there been any one person or people, and not without naming anyone, who've really been pivotal um, for you? And what, what have they done? You know, what's the, what's the essence of how they've helped you? I think there's, yeah, I won't know, but certain no. friends who have just held space and that is not, you know, when I tell them my situation or my experiences or trauma, they're not trying to fix it. They're not trying to make me feel better. They're not trying to diminish it. They're purely just listening, Yeah. you know, making me feel held and safe. And then there has also been um, one particular uh, trauma practitioner I worked with along the way and she just had this incredible belief in me that even if I didn't have it in myself mm -hmm. that she really really believed in me and saw my potential and yeah. stuck with me you know and was like became also in that like it didn't have to be in a session but I could call her anytime yeah. that I really yeah. needed so it's like it was finding those people that I feel like are rooting for me yeah yeah you know? and they're not trying to fix anything but yeah. they're there yeah they're present yeah, yeah. And until you can really believe in yourself. Exactly. And I suppose, you know, how did you hold on to the hope that things could be different or if you couldn't, did you have people along the way that could help hold on to it? Yeah, definitely. I think people along the way have helped me, but I think it was, yeah, the most important thing was that like hope in myself that yeah. I tell, I just tell myself and I still do that like, you don't go through this much to continue always going through this much. You know, the greater the struggle, the greater the triumph. Yeah. And it's even if you don't feel it, telling yourself, like, tomorrow could be better. Yeah. Tomorrow yeah. could be better. Tomorrow could be better. It will get better because you're still going. Yeah. You know? You're still trying. You're still yeah. working. And that is hope. Simply waking yeah. up in the morning and getting through the day, however chaotic the day might look, that's still finding hope that like maybe tomorrow you'll feel a little calmer, you know, yeah. and that's the thing that yeah. there's always this hope on the horizon because I feel like trauma healing, it doesn't come up unless it wants to be healed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're the epitome of hope and resilience and, you know, incredible strength. So, yeah, Thank you. remarkable. I mean, I know you discovered Blue Knot late in the journey. Do you mind talking a little bit about yeah, what you discovered and yeah, well, it was um yeah, it was a woman uh, gave me the number of lived experience because I wasn't, I didn't really know how to be connected to organisations. Like it had all been very me trying to find my own help with private practitioners. Um, a woman gave me a number to lived experience, and I read her a little bit of what I wrote. Um, this is just after I'd had my criminal compensation claim knocked up, uh, knocked back, and then she said to me. Um, yeah, if you call this woman, Kathy from Blue Knot. And I said, oh, like, what's Blue Knot? And she told me a little bit about it. And then I did some research and I spoke to you. And suddenly I just didn't feel so alone. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay, there's an organisation out there that are giving survivors platforms to speak, giving survivors hope, you know, building a support network around them and most importantly advocating for a trauma-informed world you know like there's a global pandemic going on right now yeah. but there's been an epidemic going on for many 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 years history and that's trauma yeah. and this organization doesn't look away from that yeah. it looks into it and it empowers survivors yeah. and that really touched me and suddenly made me feel connected yeah and Celeste, your contribution is remarkable. So, you know, just want to thank you. And I'm just, just wondering if there's anything else you wanted to, to share um, because you're, yeah, what you've said about building a trauma-informed world is very much aligned to, to where we come from. And I know you've lived and breathed it and, and not experienced a lot of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just think, well, thank you so much for the work that you do. And yeah. as we could all look, you know, if we just look into the future and imagine, you know, medical practitioners, not just taking your blood, asking you like, 
what have you been through in the past you know not just sending the kid at the back of the school who's causing a ruckus to the principal's office and punishing him but asking him what's going on at home <laughs> you know having a legal system that asks survivors how are you feeling are you okay <laughs> like, just things like this that a trauma-informed world that i think organizations like blue knot a number of survivors speaking up that there's this momentum being built now you know yeah. and the most powerful thing are all of these voices that are coming together because it's creating a collective voice yes that's that right. collective voice is powerful yeah and it shouldn't be that hard should it to treat yeah. other people like human beings like we all want to be treated so that's all anyone's asking asking just some understanding and as you say compassion uh look celeste thank you so much you know really appreciate your time and you're just so open and obviously articulate and you know it's amazing the messages you're you're sharing and uh you know really wish you luck i know you you're about to embark on some some emdr and uh you know, i hope it's uh you know yet another another part of your healing journey so thank thanks so much for your time thank you so much thank you. Thank you.